Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. Uh, we're going to begin this study with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we invite your spirit's presence as we open your word together, as we look again at the symbolic use of numbers and understand their significance in this movement, in our personal lives, and in your word. We just ask that you, you can bless each person who participates in these studies, that you can give us understanding and wisdom, that we can apply these things to our lives, and that we can be a witness for you upon this earth. We pray that this Sabbath can truly be a blessing, and that we can experience the fellowship and joy and peace that comes from knowing Christ and by cooperating together. Be with us now through thy spirit, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again. Happy Sabbath. Now, we're going to look at, uh, any. Um, this was actually on uh, a YouTube video. So this is um, a comment that was made. And, and it brings up something that we, we need to understand about the symbolic use of numbers. And I'm going to look at some other things as well. So one is I'm looking at, at the proper use of the symbol, symbolic use of numbers, of what they mean um, and what they don't mean. So uh, we can see, you know, last time I, I dealt with a lot of personal uh, ish, things in my life, like the, the death of my brother David, October 13th, 1990, and the death of his wife, my sister-in-law, Angela, 11,900 days later. And we looked at how that related to the Mayan calendar. So there are some personal ways in which we can take numbers. And we can also find that these numbers can relate to other types of events, external events. That is, they can, we, we've looked at in Daniel chapter 11, for instance, we've looked at the spans of time between different events that relate to 9-11 and 1989 and and so forth. Speeches, meeting, you know, the Pope, Pope John Paul meeting, uh, Ronald Reagan. And we can see significance in those things. Now, here we're having um, somebody who's definitely not in this movement. I don't know even if they're an Adventist. Uh, the name they have on their YouTube username is Mary Time Event. So I'm not sure what that means person's name is Mary, or it has to do with, you know, uh, Jesus's mother Mary or something like that. I have no idea. And and they seem, they appear to be somebody who uh, takes literal Israel as important. Now, we understand that Israel, uh, once they no longer were God's denominated people, once the covenant, after the covenant week, and Stephen is stoned, and Christ is seen standing on the right and of God, he's closing probation for the Jew, Jewish nation as a nation. They're no longer God's denominated people. And there is no God's denominated people until the Seventh-day Adventist Church becomes God's denominated people. So we know that Ellen White in Early Writings, page 74, talks about those who go back to old Jerusalem, talking about, uh, what's her name? I just can't think of it. It'll come to me. That lady who uh, uh, she was friends of Samuel Snow's. Anyway, she she does go to Old Jerusalem, and she's actually uh, well known in Israel historically as the one who introduced the growing of lemons and oranges in uh, Israel. So it's kind of interesting. If somebody can think of her name. Please tell me what it is. Uh, oh, Sister Minor. That's it, Sister Minor. So anyway, so we know that. We don't look to what's happening in Israel. We don't look to the war in Israel and and connect it to the prophecies of Scripture. You know, we don't look at the, the Seven Days War. We don't look at, you know, uh, May 14th, 1948, and try to connect that to uh, prophecies in, in the Old Testament to create 25, 20 years like many evangelicals do, right? So this person here makes this comment on on this video. Now, the video is... Uh, the video I did uh, just this past Sunday, so six days ago, April 14th, 2024. And she's going to make the comment um, a few days after that. It says here two days ago. So 
Uh, so she made the comment a couple of days ago, but she makes it on the video of Daniel's last vision, number 181, uh, dated April 14th, 2024. So she says, a reminder of the Twin Towers. So it must be something that I've said in that video. Uh, she says, Israel founded May 14th, 1948 to April 23rd, 2024. So that's three days from now is 75 years, 11 months, nine days, or 911 months and nine days. Now, so I say, uh, what is the importance of April 23rd, 2024? I should make this all the same size font so that people can see this all. Just hang on. So I ask, what is the importance of April 23rd, 2024? What line is this a part of, right? Obviously, I don't think she really understands anything about the lines. Um, she says, I'm not sure what you're asking. She says, April 23rd is a full moon that is the second Passover on the Torah calendar. Now, it's obviously not the second Passover. It's the first Passover. So she's using some kind of fake Karaite calendar where they're using the barley harvest. But because uh, I know that some uh, some people were starting the year a month early this year. Uh, even compared to the rabbinic calendar. So they're putting it too early at the start of the year. But anyway, it would be the, the, it would be Passover. April 23rd would be Passover. Many believe the Twin Towers is about Jesus coming with his bride, who some call the Twin Flames. Yes, evangelicals use 2520 in attempt to prophetically establish modern Israel. Yes, they do. Kelly just asked a question in the chat. Both seem to be colliding in numbers. And a date. A nine means omega in Hebrew. One means alpha. Eleven means twins. So I'm not really sure what she's talking about there. Maybe somebody. Why would nine mean omega? Hebrew meaning one alpha. You know, like aleph in the first letter. Eleven being twins. So I don't know. I'm not sure what she's talking about. Yeah. And... Uh, Anyway, so I respond, April 14, that is 2024, is 911 months from May 14, 1948, with the attack, and that is this attack that happened by Iran um, on the 13th and the 14th that night uh, against Israel. That's 911 months from the founding of the state of Israel. That would be more significant. However, what line are you on? I should have, like, what line on you on? Can you connect this in some other way? And then she says, uh, in order to be significant, uh, it's to, in order to be significant, it must be part of a history connected to scripture or specified prophecy. No, that's me writing. I'm writing to her. April 14 seems to be more meaningful, being 911 months. April 23rd would be Nisan 14 on the biblical calendar. If it was the second Passover, Nisan 1 would have been too early in March. For one thing, the setting of the first visible crescent must be the return of the year of the spring equinox, according to the scripture. So she doesn't then reply to any of that. So she, and this is common. People will make comments on my videos and then I'll say something and in response to it. So either correct them or clarify something. Sometimes I just ask a straight out question for them to clarify, but they don't respond. So I don't know if she even looks at it again. Sometimes people are so busy uh, just spending time point, posting comments on YouTube videos of things they believe. They're not really interested in what you have to say about them. Okay. But I mean, she did respond from my first comment. She just didn't respond after that. Now, so this is kind of interesting though, because from, yeah, drive-by postings guilty, uh, Kelly says. Yeah, I, I don't do that. I'm always interested in having a conversation. But the thing that's interesting is that she makes this comment on a video that's dated April 14th, 2024, 911 months after the founding of Israel. But she's focused upon the 911 months and nine days. Now, now I connected it when I, when I talked to her. Well, you know, Israel was attacked 911 months after the founding of Israel. But I think the significance here would, 
be almost this ironic case in which she doesn't notice something that she should notice, that that video is 911 months after the founding of Israel, that she happens to comment on. Somebody have a comment on that? I don't know what people think of that, if that seems interesting, that she takes a video that's dated April 14th. She talks about 911 months and nine days, but doesn't notice that that video is 911 months to the day after the founding of Israel. So, so what would be the significance of that 911 months? Is it that modern Israel? You know, what happens with the attack by Iran? Or is it more having to do with the fact that she makes a comment on a video made on that date? Right. So that's not significant in the big prophetic scheme of things, but in her personal, a message to her personally that God could be giving is that she needs to pay attention to what's in that video. I don't know. But you understand what I'm saying. There are things that happen in our lives, you know, like Stephen being born 11,900 days before September 11th. And if you count from November 9th, you know, 1190 days, you come to Stephen's birthday again. Right. So so the question is, would we then see significance in ancient Israel? And, and, and how would we know that it's not significant? The date of the founding of ancient Israel or of, of the state of Israel, pardon me, the date of the founding of the state of Israel, May 14th, 1948. Now we can connect it to April 14th, 2024. And so somebody could say, well, that's significant because of the attack on Israel by Iran, right? If they believed in 911 months as a symbol, but, but how do we know which is true? which is the right way to understand that symbol, right? So this is a question. The question that we're we're examining here is we have the symbolic use of numbers, but we know we can misuse the symbolic use of numbers, right? We can, it can be the symbolic misuse of numbers, right? People can draw conclusions from numbers uh, in a way that's not, not consistent with what's revealed in the plain reading of the scriptures. Does that make sense? So so we have a discussion going on on WhatsApp. And I'm not going to go there because you'll see people's phone numbers and I don't think people want to have their phone number seen. Um, so I'm just going to have to to read it. Now, there was uh, this guy, Heli Amar. I don't know what his na- actual name is. Maybe that's his last name. I don't know what it could be. And we have this big discussion Originally, it started, uh, I'm trying to see, it was a few days ago. Yeah, so it's going to start with, um, so I'm going to read these statements here. You know, we have, uh, you know, for instance, we have Daniel 9-11 and Revelation 9-11. We know these are symbols. So let's go here first. So if I have 9-11 as a symbol, right, we can see that 9-11 here is connected in Daniel 9-11. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, the curse is poured upon us, and the oath, that's the seven times, that is written in the law of Moses. So that's obviously Leviticus 26, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him, right? And we know in Revelation 9-11, we have, and they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon. But in the Greek tongue, you have this name of Polyon. And we know that that's addressing the first woe. And it's addressing when they have a king over them. And that's Othman. And uh, that is, we're going to connect the first woe with the third woe, which is 9-11. So, so we have 9-11 as a symbol. And so we already understand something without the 9-11 symbol. Even if, even if it wasn't in Daniel 9-11 or Revelation 9-11. Um, didn't have anything significant in them. It, it wouldn't, we're, we're not basing our understanding of 9-11 just upon the symbol of 9-11 in Revelation 9-11, right? Okay. So, so when we, what's the case? Somebody has a comment? Oh. Jeff? Okay, you're kind of breaking up. You, you sound like uh, a robot or something. Oh. 
Yeah, I can't I can't understand a word you're saying. Not sure why. So he's probably going to restart that again. So he probably had an important point to make or important uh, question. But for now, he's going to have to come back. He's back. Okay, Jeff, can you try it again? It doesn't look like his sound is operating yet. So anyway, what we have is a discussion in a call to unity. We're, and, and we run into this all the time. People are misusing symbols. They attribute to things that they find. One is they don't fit in the lines and they're not, they're not consistent with other things that we have taught, right? So they don't bring light. So I don't know Heliomar. I don't know how much is a problem of understanding the language differences because he has to translate everything that we're saying. And then he has to write back to us. He has to translate it back into English, what he's going to say. But he says here, uh, October 22, 1844, the seventh trumpet sounded and the third woe began. Did the third woe begin October 22nd, 1844? No, <clears throat> no, as far as I understand. The trumpet. The trumpet sounded, right? So we know the seventh trumpet sounded, but the third woe did not begin. And why do we know that? Well, the woe is even as far as the seventh trumpet. Yeah. So I didn't quite hear everything you said, but, you know, if you look at the fifth trumpet, does the first woe begin when the fifth trumpet sounds? So the fifth trumpet's going to sound in, well, different people have different dates, but let's say it's uh, 622. Does the first woe begin in 622 with Muhammad? It, we know it, be, it sounds when Muhammad, right, because it's going to talk about this here in Revelation chapter 9. The fifth angel sounded, right? And I saw, saw a star fall from heaven. That's Muhammad, right? That's when he's going to be given the key of the bottomless pit. So the fifth trumpet sounds. Did, did the first woe begin then? We, we have to say no, right? Because the fifth woe, the first woe is going to begin. The first woe is going to begin on July 27th, 1299. So just because a trumpet sounds doesn't mean a woe begins. Now, the, the ending of the first, what's that, Jeff? Okay, I can't hear, can't hear anything you're saying. I hear just jumbled, jumbled syllables. So. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, about. wait later. Do it later. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, um, and, and then we know when the, the first woe ends, then the sixth trumpet is going to begin to sound. And when the sixth trumpet ends, uh, does, do, does the second woe end at the moment the sixth trumpet ends? That is, does the sixth trumpet end on August 11th, 1840? Or does the sixth trumpet continue to sound until October 22, 1844? We know that it, it still continues to sound. So the woes occur within the trumpets, but they are not the trumpets themselves. Right. That's pretty straightforward. So there's not a reason to believe that the third woe began when the seventh trumpet sounded. Now, then he writes on May 21st, 1863, an open apostasy was confirmed and the people failed to see the return of Jesus at that time. So we, we you know, say Jesus could have come back in 1863. Right. Then he says time stopped on May 21st, 1863. He's, he's never explained what he means by that, at least in any way that I can understand. And then, and he brings up something quite interesting, which we talked about before. Uh, the time between October 22, 1844 and May 21st, 1863, it's, it's 18 years and seven months inclusive, but he says it's 18 years, six months, and 27 days. And therefore, he was only one day away from turning 18 years and seven months old. Now, of course, it, part of it is the translation. Uh, I don't know if he really means he, but definitely uh, the 18 years and seven months, in his view, would not be completed until May 22nd. So he says, because it's it's 18 years and one day short of seven months, then uh, then we would we would say that that 
time stopped and, and were put on hold for a day, right? Symbol, symbolically in some way. I don't, I don't fully understand it. Okay. So that's what he says. Now, then Stephen says, well, no, it's actually 60, um, you know, it's going to be, um, so he, he says it's 18 years and seven months with an inclusive count, right? So, so it is completed. 18 years and seven months are completed. And that's, that's very interesting. I mean, this is the date in Wikipedia that they have for the foundation of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So from October 22nd, 1844, to the Seventh-day Adventist Church being founded on May 21st, 1863, it's 18 years and seven months. That's a symbol of July 18th. That's pretty interesting, you know, for us. And, and we would say that that's significant, right? So it's a significant symbol. Now, Helia Mars really caught up in the fact that it's actually one day short, right? Now, I don't know how it could be 18 years, six months, and 27 days. Because if you count it, it would be 18 years, six months, and 29 days if you if you did a cardinal count, right? Or however you want to look at it, right? So so we we still can't figure out why he says 27 days, but that's what he has. And, and, and 20, and, and he argues that a month is actually 30 days. And so if he thinks it's 27 days, he'd have to think it's three days short. So I can't get my mind around what he's trying to say. And then he's going to deal with Leviticus 26, 8 to 11. And he's going to use, uh, I think it's the 1611 King James because it's got all the strange spelling. Then he says October 22, 1844 through to 1863 represents the sealing time of the 144,000. That period began with Sabbath being highlighted as the special truth among the many truths that are unsealed during the period of the sealing and the period, the sounding of the trump of the seventh trumpet, which identifies when the mystery of God was to be finished. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared unto his servants, the prophets, Revelation 10, verse 7. The seventh angel is also the third woe, for the sealing takes place in the history when the warfare of Islam is active. Had Millerite Adventism been faithful in the period that followed October 22, 1844, Islam that had been restrained on August 11, 1840, would have been released. No, it's not. Uh, no, it's. It's not. Anyway, the question about his name, spelling, no. Maybe, maybe he's Swedish, I don't know. So he's got some things, you know, that we can say, well, yeah, you know, this sort of makes sense here and there. But this idea that time stopped, so he's going to keep repeating this idea. And then he shows this calculator that gives this number of days. And then he talks about um, the seventh angel sounded the trumpet on uh, September 11th, 2001, and the time start started counting again. And then he says the 49th birthday, it probably means anniversary of something, I don't know, arrives on April 17th, 2032. That is, the, jub the year of Jubilee ends on April 12th, 2033. Now, I'm not sure why he's starting the year of Jubilee in the spring instead of in the fall. So a lot of this doesn't make any sense. So I, I don't know, right? So we, we try to have a discussion with him about it. We ask some questions. He never answers. I ask him about April 17th, 2032. He never answers that at all. We have some discussion about May 23rd, because that's sometimes the date given for the foundation of the Adventist Church, which would make it 18 years, seven months, and two days. So you'd have all the, the symbols of July 18, 2020. But even without that, the May 21st, 18 years and seven months is interesting enough. So... So Jeff actually, Jeff Ritz, he goes in and uh, um, makes some comments about it. Stephen Jameson makes some comments about it. And uh, we shared a little bit where Stephen uh, talked about this, the, the different dates uh, involved, May 21st, May 23rd, and May 24th, where they have a baptism of eight new believers at, you know, at the termination of the, of the general conference session. And then Heliomar tends to say, well, basically we're, we're blind. We don't hear. We're deaf. 
type of things, you know, like if we don't agree with him, sort of, you know, we're closed off to the spirit. And then he makes a, a bunch of of statements, um, which I'm going to answer. So the first one, uh, what are thunders? Since September 11, 2001, they have been sounding. Now, so this brings up a whole issue of the seven thunders. Now, the seven thunders sounded when? Where are the seven thunders? They sounded in the um, 1800s. Right. So that's going to be in Millerite history. The seven thunders are are describing the experience of um, of, of the Millerites. Right. That's going to be in Revelation chapter 10. So so note that you're going to have Revelation chapter nine that's going to address the second woe. Right. We're going to have this second woe. And, you know, so it's just going to address the second woe. It's not going to address the third woe. And then you're going to have the seven thunders. Now, the seven thunders are connected to Millerite history. And I've done a paper on this and we've studied this in detail, Revelation 10 and Ellen White's statements, uh, especially the one in, in the seven Bible commentary on this, this chapter. And we know that the seven thunders the way that this movement understood them is that they marked seven seven events. But as the movement progressed, we kept changing what events they marked in Millerite history. And then we, we have this view that the seven thunders are repeated in our history because they're just the seven way marks. But the reality is that the seven thunders are unsealed in our history. So they're sealing up the experience of the Millerites. And it's not until our movement comes along that these seven thunders are unsealed. That is, this movement, it's one of its main purposes is to understand Millerite history. That is to understand the experience of the Millerites. And it's unsealed through our experience, through the repeat of history, we come to understand Millerite history. And so it's something that's it's really clear that the seven thunders do not sound in our history. They are unsealed in our history. Now, some people may say that that's, uh, you know, just more semantical, you know, argument, right? But, but it's really clear that we are repeating Millerite history, and we're repeating it so that we can understand Millerite history. So however anybody wants to phrase that, we need to understand what that means, so he says, you know, what are the thunders? He answers the question since September 11, 2001, they've been sounding. And then he, he says, uh, two, Jesus could not know the day of his coming because the person speaking there was Christ, the son of man, not the son of God. So I'm not sure particularly what that means. I mean, he's, he, he seems to be just saying that Jesus was a man. That's why he doesn't know the day or hour of his coming. I don't know what the relevance of that is, but why why he has to put it there. And then he says, if Millerite history must repeat itself, then what was the acclamation? Behold, the bridegroom comes out to meet him. Wasn't it the return of Jesus that was being announced? So one of the things he's trying to say here is that we have to repeat the same message. Now, is it true that in every line you have the same message repeated? We, we have a message, a three-step testing prophetic message in every prophetic line. But is it the same message in every prophetic line? In no, it builds. What's that? No, it builds. Okay, it builds. But we know that it's, it's in a sense, we could say, yes, there is a certain message that is is being added to as we go through history. That is, all of these messages start to come together. But you can't have the same message because you have a period of darkness that characterizes uh, the period before a message arrives. And the message that arrived, the message has to agree or respond to the darkness that precedes it. And so each these are if, if we're going to say that it builds uh, the way that I would look at it would be like, again, I've used this an analogy lots, but an anatomy test textbook with all these transparencies that lay over top of one another of the different uh, systems, biological systems in a human being. And then, you know, finally, when you're finished, you have the complete picture of the human being. 
But each one of those transparencies is different. If they were all the same, nothing would build, nothing would, wouldn't add up, right? So, so we know that each reform line has a different message. We, we wouldn't say that we're going to be proclaiming, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him in the same context as it occurred in Millerite history based upon time. It's true. Christ is going to be coming in our history. But the loud cry is really addressing what? What's the loud cry going to address? Is it going to be addressing what the midnight cry addressed? Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out on the 10th day of the seventh month, October 22, 1844. Obviously not, right? So we won't be saying, we won't be saying that same message because it's going to be addressing Revelation 18. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, come out of her, my people, is primarily the message in the loud cry. Um, so then he's going to deal with the Jubilee, uh, Leviticus 25, verse 8 to 10. The Jubilee began on the 10th day of the seventh month, and we know that is October 22, 1844. And we know that time stopped in 1863 with the rebellion opened by the Advent people. And then he asks the question, who is opening prophecy for our time? He doesn't, he doesn't particularly answer that. And then he says in point number six, which I think is kind of an answer to number five, what is being revealed to us through Elder Jeff to me is real and it is prophecy. I understand that he himself did not realize what he wrote when he opened this Jubilee subject. And if time was not opened again on September 11th, 2001, then did the seventh trumpet not sound? And the third one there. So I think he means the third woe. And then he says, there will be one more test for the 144,000 before the ceiling. And this will bring an alignment in the understanding of everyone who will be a part of the Advent people. The eighth is of the seventh. So, so he has these mixture of things he throws at us. And, you know, and part of it is probably a language translation problem. I mean, it must be difficult, you know, use communicating through a translation program. So I answer all of these these things and then and then he says we are witnesses for or against ourselves and then he says if history repeats then the message that brought the disappointment will so also have to be fulfilled and this message is behold the bridegroom cometh go ye out to meet him was this not the message of time and judgment so then i answer that no if millerite history repeats itself since it does it is not quite the same message it is the loud cry of the third angel it is called to keep Call to keep the true Sabbath. We do not have a message based on time, on what is clear. So, you know, we're having this trouble communicating about these things, uh, trying to understand this. So here we have somebody who's who's in the movement, talking about dates in the future, um, having different interpretations of how to understand things. And, you know, obviously we have the language barrier problem. So that's that's does it make it helpful in trying to communicate but if he's going to take that symbol that he's he, he's so focused on the 18 years six months and 27 days that it's one day short is that a logical conclusion even if it was even if you say it's one day short you say well you know the church formed on may 21st and 1863 that's when they voted and it's one day short of 18 years and seven months. If you don't, if you include that day, it is 18 years and seven months, right? You know, if you're going to do a cardinal count, you have to go to May 22nd from October 22nd, right? For seven months. But is, is it just because we have a symbol, does it mean that we can get the right answer? That a symbol, in order to interpret a symbol, how do we interpret a symbol? What is, what is the, the basis, because people do this all the time. That's all I'm trying to say is I have constantly people writing me, talking about different dates or posting on um, the Facebook pages that we have where I post my video, videos, uh, making comments or sometimes just making comments on Facebook, uh, put it, posting charts with dates in the future of what they think is going to happen. And, and they find a span of time between two dates. And they think it's significant. So what do we use to, how do we know that what Heliomar is doing with this 18 years and seven months less a day, that the idea that time stopped 
on May 21st, 1863, that the seventh trumpet, seventh trumpet wasn't sounding. The third woe stopped and it didn't begin again until September 11th, uh, 2001. What's the problem? If we can have sort of a discussion on that, how do we know? I mean, maybe he's right. Maybe I'm wrong. Right. So somebody could just say, well, you know, maybe he's got a point there. What is it that we we have to do to understand how to use these symbols? So what's the first principle that we have about new light? Because really he's coming with new light. So he's bringing new light. We, we have new light all the time in this movement. But what's the principle of how we evaluate new light? The first principle. It has to agree with the old. Okay, right. So new light can't contradict old light. That's kind of interesting. I just typed new light into the EG white disc and it comes up 1,911 times. <laughs> yeah, so new light is an unfolding of old light. And we see this in Christ Object Lessons is the best place to read this. Uh, it says here, Christ in his teaching presented all truths of which he himself was the originator. Truths which he had spoken through patriarchs and prophets. But he now shed upon them a new light. How different appeared their meaning. A flood of light and spirituality was brought in by his explanation and he promised that the holy spirit should enlighten the disciples that the word of god should be ever unfolding to them they would be able to present its truths in new beauty so one is we can see that it's he's the originator of these truths that he's spoken through the patriarchs and prophets and yet he's going to give them new light and that's going to help them see what, he has, what has been spoken and written on in the past, it's going to help them to, to see this new meaning, right? And then there's a flood of light and spirituality that's brought in by this, right? And that they are able to then to present these truths in new beauty. Ever since the first promise of redemption was spoken in Eden, the life, the character, and the mediatorial work of Christ have been the study of human minds. Yet every mind through whom the Holy Spirit has worked has presented these themes in a light that is fresh and new. The truths of redemption are capable of constant development and expansion. Though old, they are ever new, constantly revealing to the seeker for truth a greater glory and a mightier power. In every age, there is a new development of truth, a message of God to the people of that generation. The old truths are all essential. New truth is not independent of the old, but an unfolding of it. It is only as the old truths are understood that we can comprehend the new. When Christ desired to open to his disciples the truth of his resurrection, he began at Moses and all the prophets and expounded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself, Luke 24, 27. But it is the light which shines in the fresh unfolding of truth that glorifies the old. He who rejects or neglects the new does not really possess the old. For him, it loses its vital power and becomes but a lifeless form. So there is a balanced um, understanding uh, presented here in that we know that there is new light but not everything that claims to be new light is new light so some people just anytime they see anything that's new or strange that they've never heard before they're scared because they're scared well maybe this is just fake new light right so i i'm not going to listen to anything that i've never heard before because there's all these winds of doctrine blowing around and somebody's got something to share that I've never heard, um, it's probably false doctrine, right? And of course, you know, that can keep you from a lot of false doctrines, but it also can keep May you I, from saving light. Yeah, Kelly? I was going to say, uh, I think one of the reasons for, for, one of the reasons for shying away from new light or new ideas, et cetera, is because of a person's unsureness, perhaps, of 
what they believe already. Like, uh, not able, not sure what they think themselves. So when they hear other other thoughts, uh, they don't know how to sort them out. Mm -hmm. Challenged. Yeah, well, that that definitely is true. Um, and we have that even within our movement. We've had people just like, this is too much work. You know, I want something simpler. There's a huge responsibility, but that spons responsibility exists for every person to study for themselves. Um, uh, one, of, one of the, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> one of the major things I, I believe, one of the major tools for sorting that out it would be, uh, already having a familiarity with the ring of truth like when i hear the the ring of truth it sounds true now i know we have to be careful with impressions and such but when it lines up with all the other impressions that have proven true it rings true it, and it doesn't either there's time it when it doesn't, doesn't ring true it's very clear very so it, re it resonates it harmonizes with what has been presented before. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, as a musician, I understand that really well. So you introduce a note into a piece of music, a new harmony. Um, if it adds to that harmony, it's in its richness and beauty, then that's, that's a good note. But if it clashes and causes discord, then obviously uh, that note doesn't belong there, right? So the idea of ringing true is that everything responds. So when I came into this movement, it rang true because the things that I already understood as a Seventh-day Adventist now became in a clearer light. I could see God's hand in, in the start of Adventism. It wasn't undoing what was established. It wasn't saying... Because many, much new light says Ellen White was wrong or she didn't have light on this or she was misled on this area um, or her writings have been tampered. That's that's why, you know, uh, she doesn't have this truth or she was controlled and manipulated by men. Right. That's that's why she she says something that's different. Right. And you can see this with all kinds of group, whether it's lunar Sabbatarians, whether it's uh, feast keepers you know, all different kinds of groups. It all comes down to at some point, they're going to reject some statements in the spirit of prophecy. Or they're going to claim that Ellen White just never had this light because there's going to be new light. She said there would be new light. And even though she has statements that appear to contradict this new light, that's just because she didn't have it. And, you know, would we do that with the Bible? Does the Bible contradict itself every time new light came in the New Testament? Does that mean the Old Testament is all wrong? That we can just reject statements in the Old Testament because that was the Old Testament? That's what evangelicals teach about the New Testament. The Old Testament was wrong, so the New Testament has this new light. Now, you know, Kelly says here it also could be the other way around. Truth may not line up with our existing beliefs, so we reject it. And that's true. So now... So we have to evaluate what those beliefs are. And, and sometimes those beliefs are things that, that we believe that we've never examined. So one thing that we do is when you are approached with new light, is you need to examine the light and you need to examine what you believe. What I believe, does it actually, is it based upon God's word? Or is it just something I was told or taught? Right? So... So there is this struggle. Light, light shines in the darkness. Darkness doesn't like light because, and, and we don't like light because our deeds are going to be exposed. It's going to reveal something about us, some deficiency. Now, this idea that we have of these numbers, the symbolic use of numbers, so that the care and attention that we should take to this is that just because we find some numbers in some dates, should not lead us to believe something that goes against the plain teachings of scripture. Now, this movement was confronted with time setting, and uh, it was first confronted with time setting in, in a real way, even though Jeff had dealt with people who were always sending him dates and, and applying literal periods of 1260 and 1290 and 1335 and 2300, etc. Um, 
days between things, predicting some kind of event in the future. We were really confronted in 2012 with Parminder. And so Parminder is going to use uh, the 126 uh, shekels and it's going to start it at 1888 and make this conclusion that the Sunday law is going to be in 2014. And Jeff calls it fanaticism, uh, which it was, right? I mean, it was definitely to, to draw that a conclusion that the Sunday law is going to happen in 2024 because of 126 years between 1888 and 2014, let's say 2024, 2014, Sunday law is going to happen in 2014. It's, it's not reasonable. Now, and also Parminder was doing this study in secret. It got leaked out. He didn't want it to get leaked out. But there were people working with Parminder. Uh, Terry Lambert was one of them back then in 2012. Tabo was another. Um, with these secret Bible studies and the secret email group. And so Tabo was privy to, to this, what Parminder was doing. But people were not supposed to be privy to it. And, and I found out about it because a guy on Facebook who was part of their group, um, who had a mental illness, uh, he started sharing it on Facebook. So anyway, it was labeled as fanaticism by Jeff and it was. But then that came back, right? So, and it came back in that in 2000, I think it was 2017, that we started to accept that Parminder's calculation was correct, which I believe it was. Uh, but that um, we didn't know enough to, to predict the event. So we could look back on it after 2014 and say, well, you know, that's going to be the split in the movement. And so it's representing something in the movement, not this external line. And so we should have known then that we can't predict the future, but we can look back on events after dates have passed and see significance in them. So that opened up the door for the time setting that Parminder brought in 2018. And, and, and I sometimes wonder why Jeff accepted it because it didn't really seem logical what Parminder was presenting. Now, now Kelly probably remembers in 2018 at the camp meeting in August where Jeff is going to talk about time setting and he's showing all the reasons why we can't time set. But then he says, but we, we can, right? And, and I wasn't really satisfied with with um, his explanation. So so I was I held this sort of in reserve, the idea that we could set time. But I, I opened my mind to look at it. And I said, well, if we can time set, it's just going to have to be something within our movement. That is, these symbols are going to apply in the movement. But we definitely can't time set on the bigger line. And so the statements in the spirit of prophecy are clear. Now, Parminder used a dispensational argument. That in our time, Ellen White's statements don't apply. Um, and, and he did it kind of in a subtle way. He used the, the argument about no more, uh, that Jeff had put forward this idea that no more public evangelism. It contradicts plain statements of the spirit of prophecy. But we're in a special time within the movement in which that, that doesn't, that doesn't apply, right? But that was still a little bit different. He, Parminder used a bait and switch. Because really what he was wanting is that none of what Ellen White says actually applies to us. We can, we can take any of her statements and say they speak for her time, not for ours. Right. And you can do that with the Bible as well. So that Ellen White could be wrong about lots of things, but she's a white Protestant woman in the United States in the 1800s. And so her beliefs have to fit into that time. And this is what I grew up with, you know, regarding the Bible. Too. You know, the Bible is good for its time, but we're more progressive now and we live in a different time. And so they just believed a lot of wrong things in the Bible. But the truths underlying those things are really what matter. And this is what Parminder and Tess were teaching in regard to the spirit of prophecy. So the fact that he rejected the spirit of prophecy, her counsel, and brought things that that had truth in them, right, because Satan always mixes truth with error. Right. To make the error more palatable and uh, and also to make that truth, the truth that he wants to mix in there to make that to sort of so that we throw out the baby with the bathwater, I guess is the best way to put it. That, you know, people will see time setting and then it doesn't happen. And then, well, 
obviously we shouldn't have time set, which we shouldn't have in, in a certain sense, um, even though God led us in that. Millerites shouldn't have time set either, but they did, right? They shouldn't have time set for the event that they did. But time does exist. We have to measure the time. So when it comes to this people who are claiming to have new light, we need to examine it, right? We talked about this last night. You know, if a brother differ, you know, don't make him out to be a heretic. You know, don't present him his message and what he's pre- presenting in a false light. You know, take the time, sit down with him. Uh, try to understand what it is he's presenting. Maybe there's light in it. Maybe you don't fully understand everything. Maybe this will be light that will, will benefit the church. But we can't, we, we have to know how to do this ourselves. Now, and Kelly got 307 hits, he says, for new light on his Android app. But that's just because he put it in quotation marks. I didn't. <laughs> and also, yeah, so I got new light. I didn't, I didn't put it in quotations like he did. And then Kelly says, I still challenged the public evangelism concept as a whole. I continue to share with everybody. I think Jeff can see the point, but not easily. And, and actually, I, I, what I understood about no more public evangelism, the idea there is that I didn't believe it was, it was good for the movement to begin adding new members, as in new Adventists, because we had first a work to do. And it doesn't mean that you don't, you know, share with people. Obviously, you share with everybody. Uh, the truths I always shared with people came in the guitar store, get a conversation, talk about all kinds of things. But public evangelism, that's the type I would think of more where uh, you have an evangelistic series and you bring people into your church. And that's what the the other groups who left in 2014, they left because they wanted to build up their churches. They wanted to do public evangelism so that they could get more funds. Right, because these ministers were dependent upon upon that, and then Kelly gets nine nineteen hundred and twenty four hits some other way, but I'm just using the e g white disk so um anyway, so hopefully that's helpful a little bit, looking at these examples, and so we can see their significance in this nine eleven from that lady's personal point of view just the fact before you move on, on yeah just be, yeah. just before you move on on that point there theodore about uh evangelism uh, I've believed that for a long time actually uh, that Ellen White says it quite clearly that God will not bring in the multitude until we're ready and because it'll hurt them and I don't think the church has been quite ready for the multitude for a long time yeah that's always been- I've seen, you know we've trickled in you it's very interesting to to see the circle of friends and family that have been influenced by Seventh Day Adventism trickle into the church, it's there's so many friends of mine, you know, and I, mm-hmm. I don't, I didn't start at all, but I, I was the first one there. This is weird to me. Yeah, well, you so, know, and, and I, I and I didn't yeah. influence every one of them either. They just came on their own from different ways, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, because I didn't become an Adventist particularly because of you, but I knew about Adventists because uh, it's Norman Byers who kind of brought me into the church. But but I knew about Adventists, and I was already keeping the Sabbath, so um, so that helped. You know, your influence helped in the sense you make people aware of something, but you're not directly bringing them in through evangelism. But but we have to spread the light, yeah. right? Yeah, def- oh. definitely, and 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 I that's exactly what I believe. Um, the l- loud cry will consist of is it'll be our witness. It won't be particularly a message that the nuts and bolts of everything, but the living witness is what's going to convert the world, mm-hmm. if anyone. Yeah, and, and this and think? this and this relates to you know really the issue of of you know organization. Uh, that we're, we're talking about and responsibility, um, being connected to Christ as the head. And, and what is it that we're supposed to do? Are we supposed to, you know, organize our efforts and start doing evangelistic series? Are we supposed to make a l- bunch of really nice slick videos 
or are we just going to continue to share the truths where we can use the media that God has given us videos, you know, my uh, academia site, with my papers. I mean, I get thousands and thousands of, of views and people reading my papers and, and watching the videos, you know, every month, people I don't know. And maybe somehow this, this seed just grows in, in a sense, organically, right? Without man's intervention, so to speak, that God takes the work into his own hands. Or is that laziness? Like maybe we, you know, maybe I'm too lazy. Maybe I should be out there you know, knocking on doors or something. I don't know. I, I don't really have an answer to that yet. But I do believe that we have a message to Seventh-day Adventists first. And I'm not sure how that that works. Um, because it's kind of on and further away from the Adventist church as far as fellowshipping with them. I'll interrupt. Yep. Uh, the, there is something actually, I don't know. This, this relates. Tell me. So there's four, four steps. First, when we're incompetent, call it, uh, okay. I'll use the words Dr. Nettley uses. So unconscious, un, incognizantly incompetent, cognizantly competent. Yeah. No, incognizantly comp, incompetent, cognizantly incompetent, then we become cognizant of our incompetence and become cognizantly competent. And then sanctification would be unconsciously, uncognizantly competent, where we are competent or sanctified, but we're not cognizant of it in a self-awareness manner. We see it in others. Mm-hmm. We see it in others, in their countenance. We don't see it in ourselves. And so uh, I don't know, does that relate? Kind of like the stages of sanctification almost. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't. All I know is we have to individually do what God is showing us. We have to be converted and we will have an influence that we don't, we don't even fully understand. That is, we have all had an influence yeah. throughout our lives to all kinds of people that. Right. That, that's that's, no that's what I'm saying. Them. Unconscious influence is good. Yeah. I mean, unconscious influence is good. You see some of it, right? Like you see people becoming Adventists. I know from my guitar store, there's there's lots of people who are aware of Seventh day Adventists. They know I was an Adventist. You know, I had my store closed on Sabbath. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, And that, and that, some of it that we see, God allows us to see because we need encouragement. But. Sorry, the cloud of witnesses that we don't see mm-hmm. and the influences that we have in the lives of others is quite amazing if you get a glimpse of it. Yeah. And that's, and that's by being just open and honest with people all the time, everywhere you go. My mom and dad had a huge influence on people just because of that, especially my mom. So, so we don't know. In the end, we will see. And, and if we try to do this in man's machinery, we might believe that we are doing more than we really are, that we could actually be doing more damage than good. But anyway, our time is up. So let's uh, close with a word of prayer. The dear Father in heaven, thank you for the studies this morning, for each person who has participated and those that watch these videos. And Lord, we know that uh, you are speaking to our hearts and that you are teaching us and correcting us. We pray for those who are resisting your correction, and uh, that sometimes includes us as well, as we know, Lord, that we often resist. It's painful to be corrected. We ask that you can correct us, that you can work in us and use us to your glory and not to our own. Bless the Sabbath, the time that we spend uh, with one another and with others, uh, that we can show forth your glory. May your angels watch over each one. May you comfort us in our sorrowing. May you protect those that we love and that we worry about. And may you give us an opportunity to show your grace and mercy to all around us. Thank you for hearing this prayer, and we pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.